Very warm welcome to each and every one of you. I hope you had a wonderful day, a wonderful Sabbath day that God has given to us. And even as we had the opportunity to begin that day together in worship, we look to bring this day to a close in worship as well. What a wonderful opportunity God has given to us. So again, welcome to each one of you. As we gather in this place, as we are here for worship, God wants to greet his people. I'd just like to invite you to stand to receive that greeting tonight. Well, congregation, God greets us this evening with these words. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Would you pray with me? God, it is so good to be in your house once again this evening. 
to be able to sing our praises to you and to acknowledge you openly and with great confidence and with trust in our voice that you are holy and that you are the great and awesome God, the only true God, the only one deserving of our praise. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this night. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that, that you, by your work on the cross, your death, your glorious resurrection, you have qualified us, you have called us to be here tonight. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you have entered our spirits that we might want to be here this evening. And so, Father, we pray that all that happens here tonight, Lord, might bring glory to you that this would be just a, a wonderful encouragement to us, but a rich blessing to you. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. I'm going to invite you to stay standing as we want to take a moment uh, for our statement of faith tonight. We're going to be using some paragraphs out of our contemporary testimony. It's entitled, Our World Belongs to God. And we're going to be using five paragraphs particularly, paragraphs 8, 14, 19, 24, and 28. Not that that matters greatly to you. Uh, those won't be numbered on the screen, but we're going to read them responsively. And uh, the key here is that you all are going to start. You're the yellow print. So you're going to start, and then it will just flow from that. So let's join in this together in the beginning. in human history, our first parents listened to the intruder's voice. Rather than living by the Creator's word of life, they fell for Satan's lie and sinned. They forgot their place. They tried to be like God. But as sinners, they feared the nearness of God, and they hid from Him. God remembered his promise to reconcile the world to himself. He has come among us in Jesus Christ, the eternal word made flesh. He is the long-awaited Savior, fully human and fully divine, conceived by the Spirit of God and born of the Virgin Mary.
Well, we have the wonderful privilege to go before our God in prayer and as a community of believers to do that uh, in fellowship and to share together uh, any praise reports or prayer requests that we may have. And just to get us started, to get us going, I have a couple to share. Uh, first of all, this came from uh, Randy Menken, his son Jim. Uh, had shoulder surgery recently, and it was a pretty uh, intense surgery, uh, lots of pain that he's dealing with. So just pray for Jim and healing, and uh, for Marv Stott, too, if you would. Julia has informed me that his condition has deteriorated a little bit such that he is no longer able to use a walker, so he's rather restricted in that way. Uh, so just pray for Marv, too, uh, in, his, uh, in his ongoing struggles. So anybody else, praise report or prayer request here tonight? Well, let's go to God together in prayer. Heavenly Father, it is so good to be able to just close our eyes and, and fold our hands and to know that, uh, that you are here and to know that as you have promised that uh, right now as we come into your presence, that we have your undivided attention. That although you are master of this universe and you are making sure that the, the sun continues to track in its path, that nevertheless, that when your children cry out to you, that you hear and that you will respond. It's an absolutely amazing thing, and you are an absolutely amazing God. And we thank you and we praise you just simply for who you are. Apart from all of the wonderful things that you've done for us, just the wonderful God you are. And Father, we pray that as we, as we continue in, in this prayer, as we continue in our worship tonight, that we might be struck again at just how great you really are. Father, we are so humbled by your goodness to us every single moment of every single day. And we are so glad to rejoice with those who rejoice. Father, we are so grateful as the offerings have shared for the 53 years of married life that you have blessed them with. And Father, for all of the blessings in those 53 years that you have given to them, all that they have experienced, the ups and the downs, but as they can testify that you've been good and marriage has been good and we are so grateful for that. And Father, we are so grateful to hear as well from Jen as she shared with us about a, about a sister-in-law getting remarried and that it's been a long journey for her and for the entire family. But now it's a, it's a point of rejoicing too. And yes, there are mixed emotions there, Lord, with all of all that has gone on before. But yet to see your hand in this, it is a marvelous thing. And we rejoice along with them. Father, we rejoice in the many ways for each one of us that you bless us from day to day. We know that if uh, we just pass the mic around, each of us most certainly could share a way that you've been good, a way that you've been faithful, a way that we've experienced your love in our lives. And Father, we're just so glad that we, can, that we can reflect all of that in praise to you. Father, we pray tonight for some of the concerns that, we've, uh, that we have heard together, some that we are aware of. And certainly we want to pray, Father, for, for Jim and the shoulder surgery he's recently experienced and, and the pain that's resulting from that. And Father, we pray for healing for him. We pray for Marv and uh, the continued struggles that he has with his health and that, in fact, his condition is deteriorated to the point where he cannot use a walker anymore. It's just not safe for him to do so and just doesn't have that balance anymore. And Father, we continue to pray that you would be with Marv, that you'd encourage him from day to day. Even as we heard this morning and prayed for, we pray again for Pat Meisty and their family and the unexpected loss of Pat's brother Michael. Father, give peace and comfort where that is needed into the lives of those who are mourning today. And Father, we pray that you'll be with Isaiah as he has fell off the monkey bars and has hurt himself. And Father, we pray that as he's now in a brace for some time, that 
that, uh, that healing would happen in his body. And we pray that you would have that healing come quickly. We pray for Vicki as she looks for a job. We pray that you would provide for her. And we pray for Larry and this broken arm that he's experienced uh, and also the shoulder issues. And it's very difficult for someone so busy and working uh, with his arm and with his shoulders on a regular basis. So, Father, we pray for decisions that now have to be made. And, Father, we pray for a, a family business that still needs to be run. And again, we pray for your provision for them. And if we as a church can come alongside them in any way, show us how we can best do that too. Make us ready to do that. Father, be with, uh, uh, with this uh, woman, I forget her name, I'm sorry, who's struggling and who has uh, had foot surgery. We pray, Lord, that you would grant healing into her life too. Uh, Father, that, that again, that healing would come quickly. It would come uh, sooner than expected. Uh, we know that those types of injuries can be very frustrating. So, Father, we pray for that. Father, we pray for the start of another church season here. We are so thankful that you have brought us through the summer months and all of the various activities as a church that we could experience together, all of the various uh, places where families could go on vacation and do all kinds of different things. But now as we settle back into a, a fall season and the beginning of our church programs and Wednesday activities, uh, Father, we, we pray for that. We're excited about uh, these. We're so thankful for all the volunteers. And Father, we pray for all of those who will come and all of those who will participate. And we pray for many in our community uh, to come and to join uh, the ministry activities. And Father, most of all, we pray that, that through these, that we would continue to be that bright light for Jesus that you want us to be. And Father, again tonight, we pray for the victims of Hurricane Dorian. Again, uh, today, perhaps we've seen those images on television and this, the, the unbelievable and heartbreaking devastation that uh, has happened in so many places Father, we pray for those who are homeless. We pray for those who are looking for their loved ones. We pray for those who have lost loved ones. And we pray, Father, that you would give them each what they stand in need of. And that, Father, even as so many uh, people have already risen up to give aid and to help, that, that your church as well would rise up to, to give aid and to seek to help and to, to bring comfort to those who need that. Father, even through our denomination, if we're able to do that, that you would show us the way. Father, we know that there is so much to bring before you in prayer. And we are so grateful for this, this, uh, this privilege, this opportunity this, uh, that you've given to us. And Father, we know that, that prayer, as the catechism reminds us, is the chief part of our gratitude to you. Because this is about relationship and building a closer relationship with you. And so we're grateful that we can do that. We're grateful that we, can, that we can engage in prayer on an individual basis and grateful that we can engage in prayer as a community of faith as well. And Father, again, so grateful that you always hear and you always will respond. Father, bless us as we continue in our worship tonight. As we give of our gifts in just a moment, as we listen to your word, as, as we respond, as we are sent out to serve you and sent out to share the, the good news of Jesus, that God, through all of this, you would be glorified, that your kingdom would advance, that your people would be encouraged. We pray all of this in Jesus' name and in the power of the Spirit. Amen. Well, this time we do have the opportunity to give of our gifts. The offering tonight is for growing hope globally. And may we give as God leads us to do that this evening. Our offertory tonight is a setting of Psalm 139, which we'll be hearing from um, in the sermon in a few minutes. I invite you to read along or sing along or just listen if you'd rather. This is called, In You, O Lord, I'm Found.
you sing with me? sanctuary pure and holy tried and true with thanksgiving I'll be a living sanctuary Thanks, Noah, and uh, everybody else uh, for that special music number. I really appreciate that. And then to sing that song, Sanctuary, and be prepared for God to fill us tonight. I appreciate that very, very much. And congregation, as, uh, as most of you uh, are well aware of, uh, through the summer months, we have just been kind of going um, kind of Sunday by Sunday, taking a look at, at certain psalms. We've been involved in this series called Songs of the Saved. Uh, it's a series in which we're taking a look very specifically at what I imagine are familiar psalms to most of us. In fact, we started this way back on May 19, believe it or not, and uh, as I reflected on that, that was just the Sunday after my installation. So we've been at this for a little while uh, so it's, it's just been all the way through the summer, but tonight uh, we are bringing this particular series to a close. Uh, Lord willing, next Sunday uh, night we are going to dive headlong into an overview series on the Heidelberg Catechism, and I am really excited about that. Uh, but right before we get there, we want to kind of wrap things up by taking a look at another uh, familiar, maybe even a favorite psalm for many of us, and that is, as Noah mentioned a moment ago, Psalm 139. So I'd like to invite you to take your Bibles out and turn there. I'm going to read that psalm for us, the entire psalm, all 24 verses, and you're going to find this on page 618 of your pew Bibles there, page 618. And again, this is Psalm 139. It's a psalm of David. So here David writes, is carried along by the Holy Spirit. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, Behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in a sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts, 
You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as of yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I'm still with you. O oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God! O men of blood, depart from me! They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. So as far as we're going to read in God's word tonight, and may he bless his word to us. Well, congregation, uh, commentator James Montgomery Boyce, uh, whose name you have heard before if you've been tracking along with the series, and certainly whose thoughts have been invaluable to me as we've made our way through this series, looking at these various psalms. Well, he says, as he begins his reflection on Psalm 139, he says, somewhere in J.I. Packer's writings, there is a reference to Puritan theology as theology of the older, better, wiser, and more practical sort. Well, that, says Boyce, applies to the Puritans, but it applies even more to Psalm 139. Here, he says, is theology that is even older, better, and wiser, and even more practical. It is theology of the very best sort. And Boyce goes on to explain himself a little bit more, and he says this really is theology of the very best sort because it engages our entire being. It doesn't just engage our, our head as opposed to our heart, and it doesn't just engage our heart as opposed to our head, but it really does engage both, the head and the heart. He says it is strongly theological, but it is also wonderfully personal. And I really couldn't agree more. In fact, you may have sensed that as I read through it for us just a moment ago. But in this psalm, David is touching here on profound attributes of God. But yet, as the Lutheran scholar H.C. Leupold put it, Psalm 139 is not formulated in theological abstractions, but in terms of personal religious experience. So there are three attributes that we want to touch on tonight, three attributes that David brings out very clearly that really he celebrates in this psalm, three key attributes that really do set God apart as God, and not just as a God among many, but as the only true God. We find those three attributes in the first 18 verses of this psalm, which really break down rather nicely for us. You can even see it in the text in terms of three specific stanzas. So the first stanza is verses 1 through 6, where David praises God for his omniscience. That is to say for the fact that God knows everything. And of course that comes out in those opening verses there, but it's really summarized. It's kind of in a nutshell here in verse 2 where David says, God, you know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern, you know my thoughts from afar. He goes on further, he says, before even a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. You know all of this, God. So David acknowledges, he celebrates the fact that God knows all things, and furthermore, that he knows all things perfectly. One commentator I ran across says, says this with respect to the omniscience of God. I thought it was really helpful. He says, God knows everything. And he goes on to explain, God knows everything possible, everything actual. He knows all events, all creatures of the past, the present, and future. He is perfectly acquainted with every detail of life when it comes to every single being in heaven, on earth, and in hell. 
Nothing escapes his notice. Nothing can be hidden from him. Nothing is forgotten by him. He never errs, never changes, never overlooks anything. This is God. This is his omniscience. The great theologian A.W. Tozer adds this. He says, God knows instantly and effortlessly. Think about that. Instantly and effortlessly. All matter and all matters. All mind and every mind. All spirit and all spirits. All being and every being. And because God knows all things perfectly, He knows no thing better than any other, but all things equally well. He never discovers anything. He's never surprised. He's never amazed. He never wonders about anything, nor does he seek information. And he doesn't ask questions that he doesn't know the answers to. This is God says David. And for David, and really for any one of God's children, knowing this about God, it's not only wonderful. In fact, David goes on to say, this is too wonderful for me. This is is too much for me to even take in. But it's not just wonderful. In fact, it's a great comfort. It's a marvelous comfort. Now, some people might want to argue that point and say, no, that's you know, God is interfering in my, my privacy, right? All these privacy issues today, that God shouldn't know my thoughts before I think them. God shouldn't know what word is on my tongue before I say it. But as God's children, we say, what a wonderful comfort. That's not something to be scared of. That's not something to threaten us. That is a wonderful refuge, God's omniscience. Then the second attribute that David praises God for is his omnipresence, right? This incredible reality that God is everywhere. That in fact, there is nowhere, as David says, there's nowhere he can go, there's nowhere that any one of us can go that God is not. So verses 7 through 12, it's the second stanza of the psalm. It celebrates exactly that. And I want to take a moment and just have you listen to those verses again. David says, where Shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, there you are. If I make my bed in Sheol, in the depths, as the NIV used to put it, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as day, for darkness is as light to you. One person said, never has the pen of man more effectively described the omnipresence of God. And no doubt he's right. But at the same time, David also captures the incredible security that God's omnipresence brings into the lives of those who are his. And what great confidence that gives us to know that wherever we go, wherever we may find ourselves, that it is never too far away from God, that he is always where we are, that there is nowhere where God's presence cannot be. But wherever we are, there God is. And then the third attribute that David praises God for in this psalm is his omnipotence, all right? That is to say his complete and absolute power. And very interestingly, it's an omnipotence that David sees uh, mostly displayed in one of the most intimate of places, and that, of course, is a mother's womb, right? That's what he talks about here. That's what he describes in verses 12 through 18, the third stanza of this psalm. And I would suggest that most of us know these verses really well. I think these are verses that that even are near and dear to our heart, if we were just to pull some verses out of this psalm. This, these may be the verses we know the best, particularly verses 12 through 16. 
fact, as you know, these verses are very often cited in the pro-life movement as proof, of course, that life begins at conception, and rightly so. These verses speak directly into that very, very clearly, tell us that life begins at the very moment of conception. It is right then and there that God's creative power is at work. He is fashioning, he is forming, he is weaving, he is ordaining. And without minimizing the pro-life movement usage of these verses, I think we need to remember that this comes in a bigger context here, in a bigger picture that David is presenting to us of a God who is all-powerful and a God whose power simply cannot be thwarted. Now, it can be challenged. It can be challenged, but it's not going to be overcome and it is not going to be defeated. As one person put it, a a God, a God whose will is resisted, whose designs are frustrated, whose purposes are checkmated, possesses no title to deity, and so far from being a fit object for worship, merits nothing but contempt. But that's not our God, says David. So, in the first 18 verses of this psalm, David takes the time to go through these three attributes of God. The fact that he is all-perceiving, he is all-present, he is all-powerful. But as I mentioned at the very outset, this psalm, although it is strongly theological, it is also wonderfully personal. And in the closing stanza of this psalm, here in verses 19 through 24, David declares two practical and very personal implications, a personal response to everything that he's proclaimed. And first of all, in that respect, David declares that that he wants nothing to do with evil. He wants nothing to do with, with evil persons or their evil desires. He wants absolutely nothing to do with it. Verse 19, oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God, O men of blood, depart from me. David says, keeping in mind all of this that I know about God, the one true God, I want nothing to do with evil. I want nothing to do with the evil schemes that evil men devise. So taken was David with the majesty and the glory of God, the wonder of who God is, that he wants absolutely nothing to risk or threaten or to compromise his relationship with God. And so as David goes on to declare in verses 21 and 22, and maybe these are verses that perhaps make us bristle just a little bit, David says, do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. And maybe if we were to lift those verses out of this psalm and just take them out of context, we would say, wow, those verses really make me bristle. Are we supposed to really talk like that? But David's point here in the context of Psalm 139 is to say David is declaring his absolute allegiance and loyalty to God and to absolutely nothing and no one else. And the fact of the matter is, as children of God, like David was, as we are by grace through faith in Jesus, you and I, we need to be able to say the same thing, maybe not with the same words, but with the same sentiment of spirit. Declare that my allegiance, my loyalty is with the one true God. And only him. That's what David is saying. And then secondly, David goes on to declare as he brings this psalm to a close that he wants to continue to walk and to grow in God's way. And he acknowledges that he's going to need God's help to do that. In verses 23 and 24, Search me, O God, know my heart. Try me, know my thoughts. See if there's any grievous way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. And I'm guessing that we know those words well too. But do we comprehend just how courageous a prayer that is? To invite God's light to shine into our lives. And say as David does, here I am, God, search me, test me, try me. 
If there's anything in me that shouldn't be there, get rid of it. That's a brave prayer. That's a courageous prayer. But as Boyce reminds us, he says, it is what every wise believer should desire. Every wise believer. That's what we should desire. That was David's desire. And may that be our desire as well. In response to what we now know, to what David has shared with us of the one true God. Psalm 139 is probably very well known to us for a variety of different reasons. But I hope that now that we've had a chance to take a little bit closer look at this psalm, I hope that we're not just kind of saying it's one of our favorites, it's one that kind of sticks out to us just because of a verse or two, but in fact now because of the entire psalm. Because it celebrates the all-perceiving, the all-present, the all-powerful God. And that based on that, just like David, that we are ready, that we are willing to pledge our allegiance and our loyalty only to this God. And that we're ready to surrender ourselves completely to him. Well, I hope that we've found it interesting to make our way through these psalms. Now, many of them favorites, many of them that we turn to again and again. You now we see them reminded up there, the ones that we looked at through this study, Psalm 1, 19, 23, 27, 32, 42 and 43 together, 46, 51, 91, 98, 103, 121, and 139. These are psalms we turn to over and over again. And I hope that you have found it enlightening to dig into these just a little bit deeper. I hope that you've grown in your appreciation for these psalms. That was the goal. And I know that I've grown in my appreci appreciation for these psalms as well. And I hope that maybe, maybe it's ignited within you a passion to pursue the Psalter just a little bit more. And that you'll be ready at every turn, even as we've experienced in this study, you'll be ready to be encouraged, to be comforted, to be challenged, and to be inspired as only God can do. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to spend all of these weeks digging into these favorite psalms. And we thank you for Psalm 139. We thank you for the wonderful theology it presents us with and as it lays out for us these incredible attributes of yours, your omniscience, your omnipresence, your omnipotence, the fact that you are all perceiving, you are all present, and you are all powerful but we are so thankful that Psalm 139 doesn't stay up here, but it brings it down here. And that even as David responded, that we would be ready and willing to respond, that we would declare our loyalty to be only with you, the one true God, and that we would make ourselves available, that we would surrender ourselves to you, so that we might continue to walk and to grow in your way. Father, we pray that as we sing this next song in just a moment, I surrender all, that we may have in our thoughts, in our head and in our heart, not just what we've thought about with Psalm 139, but of what we've reflected on of all the psalms that we've dug into. And to know that finally this is the call of the Psalter to surrender ourselves to you. And to do that in the name and for the sake of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Would you stand?
Receive God's parting blessing. May the love of God the Father and the grace of Jesus Christ the Son, the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.